questions today. So take a look at, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead, Katie. Okay, so take a look at these two functions, f and g. What do you get when you compute f of 5? Yeah, f of 5 is 3 times 2, which is 15, minus 2 is 13. And then if I calculate g of 13, right, if I take the output from f and plug it into g, what do I get? I get 5 back. 13 plus 2 is 15, over 3 is 5. So f and g are like a round trip, right? You plug in a 5 you get a 13. Plug a 5 into f, you get 13. Take that output and plug it into g, and you get 5 back. So we plugged the 5 into f was the first thing we plugged in, and it was the last thing that came out. Okay. So it was like a round trip. So let's calculate g composed with f at any generic x. So remember G circle F, that means G <clears throat> of F of X. I don't have a value for X, so I'm going to replace F of X with its formula. So this is going to be um, G of 3X minus 2. So that means that take your 3X minus 2 and apply the rule G to it. So G does whatever you plug in plus 2 over 3. So this is going to be 3x minus 2, replacing the x with that, plus 2 over 3. And then the minus 2 and the plus 2, those cancel. And then I have 3x over 3, which is x. So my input was an x, and my output is the same thing, x. So if I were to plug a 5 to take g of f of 5, I should get 5. g of f of 7, I should get 7. So again, g and f are a round trip. Plug something in, you get that thing back. All right, you guys, for a little practice, calculate f composed with g. So we just did the reverse. We did g composed with f. Now do f of g of x. Okay, so this time, just replace this g of x with its formula. So we're going to have f of x plus 2 over 3. So that means I'm going to drop an x plus 2 over 3 into the f function machine. And f does 3 times whatever you plug in minus 2. So this is going to be 3 times this formula I'm plugging in minus 2. So what happens here is my 3's cancel, and then I get x plus 2 minus 2, which is x. So the same thing happened in the reverse order. f of g of x also gave me x. So again, it's a round trip. So that the two functions reverse each other, or undo each other, we call g the inverse function of f, two functions that undo each other are called inverse functions. <clears throat> so f and g are inverses of each other if when you compose them in either direction you get x. That means that they undo each other. So if g is the inverse function of f, we, we call g f inverse and this is our notation. It says f, it looks like an exponent negative 1, but we're repurposing that notation to mean something else now. It doesn't mean f to the negative 1. We read that as f inverse. And it just means the function that undoes f. Okay. So this has happened a couple times in this course so far where we've taken notation that meant means something else to us and repurposed it. I used it for something else. And you have to be able to tell from the context which one we mean. If it means f to the negative 1, f is a rule, not a number, so you can't raise it to the negative 1 power. So when you see f to the negative 1, if you know f is a function, this must mean f inverse. If I wrote f of x all in quantity, that would mean y, and I put to the negative 1, that would mean 1 over f of x. That would mean f of x to the negative 1.
Okay, so what is the inverse of putting on your socks and then putting on your shoes? How do you want to do that? Take off your shoes, then take off your socks. So you had to undo it in the reverse order that you did it. Does that make sense? You do socks, then shoes. To undo it, you have to do shoes, then socks. So the reverse order of what you did undoes stuff. So how would I find the inverse of adding 3 to x and then multiplying the result by 6? Divide by 6, then subtract 3. Okay, so you undo in the reverse order. So my order that I did was add 3, multiply by 6. So I want to undo the last thing I did first. So the first thing to undo is the last thing I did. So but the last thing I did was multiply by 6. To undo it, divide by 6. Then work your way back. Okay, so to undo the add 3, subtract 3. So if I want to make a table for f inverse, given a table for f, Yeah. So how how did you know that? Why? You're you're right. You're right. Can somebody help him out? Yeah, Ryan. You should get out x. Yeah. So when I plug f of x into the inverse function, I should get x back. It's a round trip. F and F inverse make a round trip. So if I plug a 1 into F and I get a 2, if I plug a 2 into F inverse, I should get the 1 back. Right? Because inverse functions make a round trip. So if I plug an X into the F function, if I plug a 2 into the F function and I get a 5, then if I plug a 5 into F inverse, what should I get back? 2. And if a 3 goes into f and I get 7, then a 7 into f inverse should give me 3 back. So these are two machines that just undo each other. It's like if you had a, a one machine that takes a piece of paper as the input and makes a paper crane or something. Then you drop a paper crane into the next machine and it flattens it out into another plain piece of paper. So they just totally undo each other. So this one would be 4, 4, and this one would be 1, 5. So inverse functions just swap input and output. You can tell from this table. What used to be x and y swaps for the inverse function. So that means that the domain of f is the range of f inverse. And the range of f is the domain of f inverse. The domain and range also swap because the domain is just the set of all inputs and the range is a set of all outputs. But not all functions have an inverse function. Here's a, a graph of f of x equals the absolute value of x. If I fill in this table, take the absolute value of all these x's, I get 2, 1, 0, 1, 2. Then I'm going to make um, a table for the inverse function, which just swaps input and output. So I'd get 2, negative 2, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 2. So what's the problem with my f inverse here? Oh, well, this isn't the absolute value function. This is the inverse of the absolute value function. So that's a good thought, though. What's my problem? Why, why isn't it an inverse function? Why isn't it a function? This to what? Yeah. Yeah, I have an input, one input of two, giving me two different outputs. 
right? Remember the definition of a function was that each input can have only one output? Here I have the same input two giving me two different outputs. So I have inputs into the inverse function that give more than one output. So that means that this thing that we're calling f inverse is not a function. So because this class is all about functions, the study of functions, we're going to say that if a function's inverse isn't a function, we just say it doesn't have an inverse. Okay, so this table gives me the inverse of f, but it's not a function. So we just say it does not have an inverse, but we mean it doesn't have an inverse function. Its inverse is not a function. So graphically, the problem with thinking about the absolute value function not having an inverse is that because there are two inputs that go to the same output, that's okay for f, right? Remember that that's okay when we're talking about whether or not the graph is a function. We're allowed to have two inputs go to the same output. But when we swap the role of input and output, now I have one input, this 3, giving me two different outputs when you reverse x and y. So the problem graphically we could summarize by saying a horizontal line touches the graph in more than one spot and it does not have an inverse function. So So if a horizontal line touches the graph in more than one place, then it does not have an inverse function. We call that the horizontal line test. So now we have two line tests. The vertical line test, what does that tell you? Whether or not the graph is that of a function. And the horizontal line test, you always do after the vertical line test. First, you want to know whether or not it's a function. Then you do the horizontal line test, and that tells you if your function has an inverse. So if I draw a function that's increasing everywhere, as I read it from left to right, it's always growing. So it would look something like this. Right. There are lots of different ways I could draw it. But it's always going uphill. Sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but always uphill. What can I say about a function that's always increasing? It has an inverse. Yep. It will have it, it will pass the horizontal line test. because it passes horizontal line test. So if a function has an inverse, we call the function one-to-one. -one. 
So this is just the special name that we give to functions that have inverses. They are one-to-one -one functions. Because the outputs have to correspond to the inputs in a one-to-one -one manner, so each input has exactly one output, and each output came from exactly one input, one-to-one -one correspondence. So looking back at the table for x, we, to we could tell that it wasn't one-to-one, -one because it didn't have a one-to-one -one correspondence. It didn't have each input goes to exactly one output. We had an input, oh, I'm sorry, we did have each input went to exactly one output, but each output didn't come from exactly one input. So my output of two, I can get two different ways. I can get there via negative two or x equals positive two. So it was not one to one. So you can see it graphically with the horizontal line test, and you can see it in a table if there are two y's that come from two different, there's the same y that comes from two different x's. So it's important to be able to interpret these things in uh, real world word problems. So if p equals f of t gives the population of Greenfield as a function of time, so t is measured in years since 1900, P is population. What are the inputs of this function? T. Time, T, in years. And what are my outputs? Populations, yep. Population P um, in number of people. So these are the inputs and the outputs for F. So if I were to talk about F inverse, I would swap them, right? Its inputs would be population and its outputs would be time. Because F inverse just swaps input and output. All right, so what would F inverse of 1400 equal 57 mean? Yep, yep. The population was 1400 people. in 1957, because we were measuring time in years since 1900. So usually what's in parentheses is an input, right? And what's outside is an output. That's still the case, right? It's just that the inputs of F inverse are the outputs of F. So this was a population and this was a time, because inverse functions switch the role of input and output. Okay, so here's another one. I want you to discuss in your groups um, B and C, and then we'll, we'll go over it together. So C equals F of Q gives cost in dollars to manufacture Q lunch boxes. So what are my inputs? into this function. Number of lunch boxes. And the variable we use to represent that is Q. Yep, so my outputs is cost in dollars. So F inverse of 200 swaps the role of input and output from F. So that means that the 200 is an input to F inverse, but it was an output from F. So this is a cost. And my 40, it's an output of F inverse, which means it was an input of F. So this is a Q number of lunch boxes. So now I can write my sentence. What does it say? Yep. 
cost two hundred dollars to produce forty lunch boxes. So in general, the inverse function gives you the number of lunch boxes you can make for a certain cost. You plug in cost and you get out number of lunch boxes. So the inverse function calculates number of lunch boxes possible for a certain cost. Right? Whereas the regular function f was the reverse. You would plug in number of lunch boxes and it would calculate cost. So you'd have lunch boxes as the input and cost as the output. This one, you input a cost and it tells you how many lunch boxes you can make. So here's another one. T equals F of V. It gives the time and hours it takes to drive to New York City as a velocity of V at a at a velocity of V miles per hour. So what are my inputs here? Velocity, yeah. In miles per hour. So that's what we plug in. And then the function calculates for us our output, which is what? Time. So it's like a computer, right? You just type in the speed you plan to drive, and it tells you how long it's going to take you to get there. But f inverse is going to reverse that. You're going to give it an output from f, which is a time. And it was going to output one of f's inputs, which is a speed. So this sentence says that if I want to drive for three hours, I should go 65 miles per hour. To get there in three hours, drive 65 miles per hour. And in general, what I feed into this machine is a time. I would put in a three hours, or four hours, or five hours, or one hour, and this machine will tell me what speed to drive to get there in that time. So this inverse function calculates speed necessary to arrive in a certain amount of time.